Alright everybody, I think we'll start. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, it's great to see a lot of new faces and also faces from our previous session, so thanks for coming back. Um, what we want to talk about now is, we're in this predicament. Right, we talked about in the previous panel about the deep state, how they kind of got us into this predicament, who they're working for. Now, we got to get ourselves out of this predicament, right? We have Trump in power, we have chaos in almost at every extent the government, and we need to somehow take power back. Now, we're going to take kind of a quick post-mortem on the last election. We'll talk about some things that are starting to show some signs of life, things that are working. And then we're going to get really hardcore into some organizing and some economics that can really bind us all together here as a movement. So just to go over our panel, our panel is about here the common denominator, an economic program to unite women, blacks, Latinos, students, labor, anti-war activists. My name is Gregory Edwards. Like I said, I'm representing the Tax Wall Street Party and the United Front Against Austerity. We we'll also have Dr. Webster Tarpley, also part of our group with us today. And uh, we're looking forward to also the, more of a discussion this panel. So you know, we'll, do, we'll give our presentations. I'm looking forward to talking to everybody, engaging everybody uh, in more of a forum atmosphere. So um, let's get into some of the negative stuff first. We'll get it out of the way. What happens when we don't find a common ground, right? If we're just, the Democratic Party is kind of like a bunch of groups, right? So we're, we kind of have Me Too, right? We have, we have the Black or Latino over in here. We got Latinos, we have uh, climate change, environmental, we got labor, right? We have a whole bunch of bunch of these different there's more and more. So we have all of these groups, and we need to kind of unite if we're gonna take power back, right? So how do we do that? If you look at these individually, they kind of have there are some things that we come across where we cross lines. Well, they sort of have their own stuff going on, right? So what happens? 2016 campaign. Here we go. We're getting right out of the way quick. 304, 227. Donald Trump, next president. Loses the popular vote, right? 60, almost 67 million to 63 million. I know I couldn't sleep all night. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but but man, yeah. I think he got 306. You got to watch out. He's going to sue you now. That was uh, three hundred six. <laughs> <laughs> so this this left for a restless night and a rough couple of weeks trying to figure out where do we go from here. You know what what do we do? Do I have to delete my Facebook account? Should I get off of Twitter? I got all these things fighting against Trump. What do I do? What do I do with myself? Now? Do I leave the country? Right. This was a big yeah. one. You heard this a lot. Do we get out of here. Do we go? So. We want you to say, we need, to, we need you to stay, right? We need to organize together. We need to get back power. We need to get this guy out. And the only way to do it is to find that common ground. So let's take a look at some things that are, well, let's take a look at the 2016 presidential uh, campaign, the Democratic side specifically, and see what did not work. Like I mentioned, we're, we're stuck in this identity politics, like Hillary ran on identity politics. She talked about all these groups. But she didn't get into some core values that could really tie us together. Right, so here's the uh, pretty much a definition of identity politics: social organizations based on age, religion, social class, class, caste, culture, dialect, disability, education. Goes on and on and on. You get the idea. Classic Hillary Clinton gaffe in the campaign, revolving around identity politics with the labor movement. Right, she's in West Virginia. And she says, we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. Are you crazy? <laughs> Regardless of how much you, you, know, you uh, feel about climate change, and yes, we want to move to some more modern forms of energy, right, of course. But if you think you can win West Virginia and come out with a statement like that, I'm sorry, it's just not going to work. You have to be better than that, right? You have to think a little bit more. You have to finesse the situation a little bit. You know, talk more about some of these core labor issues, which she had on her campaign. You couldn't find it anywhere, right? So let's go into some of those things here. Hillary Clinton's economic demands buried somewhere in Brooklyn Heights, somewhere in that office. Paid family leave. New parents can take time off without losing their job, right? Wonderful. Crosses all these lines. Preschool for every four-year-old in America, right? We want to we want to have we want to have the best workforce in the world. We got to have the most educated workforce in the world. You got to start young and work all the way through college, not just high school. Debt-free college, right? We just mentioned college here. If you're going to college, you want to get, you know, work from a doctor, you want to get anything. It's going to cost, you got to take out loans. We can't have 
a society, a workforce that's oppressed by these loan payments. They can't start their life. They gotta pay off, they can't even get to the principal. They're still paying off the, the interest. So if she wanna spend 35 billion a year to refinance student debt and pay states to guarantee tuition. So if you went to a state agency, ideally we could get a free education like we focused on, but that's fantastic. Where are these things? You, you never, did anyone hear her talk about this stuff? I mean, this is on her website. Expanding social security. Right, great thing, who's against that? Raising the minimum wage, she said 12 to 15, let's just go right to 15, why are we gonna stop at 12? But great thing, we definitely wanna raise that up. Once again, all these parties are affected by this and they could be tied in by these at these points. They're great, they're great starting points. Allocate 27.5 billion annually to a national trans infrastructure plan to improve roads, bridges, public transit, rail, airports, internet, water systems. We're gonna talk more about this a little bit later. Um, but the National Infrastructure Report, D plus for the United States in 2017, right? 3.6 trillion to get back to a state of good repair. So this is obviously something everybody's affected by. Commuting, you know, any kind of travel, transportation, uh, businesses, right? The, the flow of commerce, all these things come tied together. Support unions and collective bargaining. You know, look, look, how does this work? How can you say this, right? And then how's this on here? How could you come out with a comment like this? Right? You gotta be better than that. You have to know where you are. Right? You're in West Virginia. You can't just go. If you're in California, maybe that, that comment may work. But if you're in West Virginia, you just can't do it. You're dead in the water right there. You can't just give away states. Strengthen the Affordable Care Act. Expand, expand job training. Fund health and retirement plans for coal workers. She actually mentioned coal workers. And I, I don't know. You know what, how could she do that? So, continuing on. A path to citizenship for illegal immigrants. Expansion of immigration opportunities for highly skilled workers. Comprehensive, a comprehensive immigration reform. Grow economy, keep families together. We see with the Trump regime now, what they currently do if they find you at the border, they break your family up. This is a monstrous policy. I don't care who you are. Who, 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 could, who, could, who could believe that stuff like that is going on in this country? Now, let's talk about some positives here. I want to take two campaigns of recent history here that are exactly what we're talking about. What we need going forward, right? We need to find that, that denominator that binds us together. This is a perfect example of it. Governor of Georgia, the, uh, she just became the, she won the primary for the governor of Georgia, Stacey Abrams, right? She's the first black woman to win a major party primary for governor. And then we'll, we'll contrast that, compare and contrast that with the Pennsylvania Demi uh, congressional uh, seat, Connor Lamb just won not too long ago, right? He's a white centrist ex-Marine from Pennsylvania in the heart of Trump country, right? So these, these are nowhere near together, right? This, you look at these two from afar and you said, these guys, there's no way they're on similar paths here, right? So how did they run their campaigns, right? Uh, Stacey Abrams needed, she needed a strong liberal turnout from sub the suburbs, right? A strong left-leaning turnout in the suburbs of uh, Atlanta, uh, particularly Atlanta and, and other suburbs. And then Connor Lamb, right? He's a little bit more, you know, he's kind of pro-gun. He's not ostracizing Trump supporters, right? He needs these people to vote. He can't win. It's just that, that that congressional district is predominantly Trump supporters, right? So he won uh, overwhelmingly Trump won that, 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 that congressional district. So he can't just go in there and start saying, you know, things that maybe Stacey Abrams can say in a suburb of Georgia. So how did they both win this, how did they both get this, uh, this success? So they both ran pro-labor, right? They both uh, ran full labor platforms. Supported, uh, Stacey Abrams supported Medicare expansion. This is fantastic. Connor Lamb, despite the fact that he's in Trump country, he went after Paul Ryan. He said, Paul Ryan said that um, uh, these title and programs, you know, that these people don't deserve them, these things like that. He went right after him. And he ran to protect the Social Security and Medicare. So you would, would you hear that from a Trump supporter or a Trump candidate? No. But he was able to balance this out, right? And these people backed him because of that. They said, hey, these are issues we have. We need Social Security and Medicaid to survive. You go to Pennsylvania. You know, they've been hit really hard by the economic depression. So this tying, tying us all together. Now, Stacey Abrams, federal government assisting local governments for roads, bridges, power, and waterways. I tried to take the language right from their site. So you can go back and look at this and and see how they compare. If you look at some videos of these two compare, uh, campaigning, now go on YouTube, take a look. They almost sound identical, but they're, they're looking to get, theoretically, two totally different constituents, right? But they somehow did it. And why did they do it? And that's because we're talking about economics. Mass traction, economic demands. That's how they did it. 
So Connor Lamb, he wants federal government to lead infrastructure development, right? Pennsylvania, you know, the infrastructure is crumbling just as much as Atlanta or anybody else. So this, everybody experiences that. So we need to fix that. Let's talk about the victory in Virginia, right? We have uh, Ralph Northam for governor, ran on the four on expanding Medicaid for 400,000 people. Um, just a couple of days ago, this is really impactful, May 30th, Virginia will join 31 other states and the District of Columbia providing health insurance to its residents who are up to 138% above the poverty level. Um, of the poverty level, excuse me. So that's about 400,000 people. Um, now we have Maine and Utah and Idaho sort of kind of right behind us maybe. So these are interesting states not normally uh, associated with uh, democratic views. And Obamacare, something that may be kind of full power. Although Maine is very much a good. Um, Okay, let's talk about the Texas Democratic Party primary. This was interesting. Uh, we're going to get into our program in a slide or two, but I just want to show you um, this interesting point. So we have these three propositions in uh, particular notice here. Prop two, should everyone in Texas have the right to refinance student loan debt with the Federal Reserve at a 0% interest rate as relief for the crushing burden of debt and investment in the next generation of Americans? Overwhelming support, over 90%. Said yes. Prop three, should everyone in Texas have a right to health care guaranteed by universal quality Medicare for all system? Also, over 90% said yes. Should the Democratic Party promote a national jobs program with high wage and labor standards to replace crumbling infrastructure, rebuild hurricane damaged areas, paid for with local, state, and federal bonds, financed through the Federal Reserve, low interest with long term maturities? Over 90% said yes. Now, I mean, for us, this is essentially what we are trying to get out of the nation. So something like this to be in the Texas Democratic primary is just fantastic. It's, a, it's about as everything we could hope for. So you know, our goal is for people to just take our program and run with it, right? Go ahead and do it. Get it out there. 90% support in Texas Democrats. We have this issue with Generation Z, right? So they're, they're kind of been, they were born after 9-11. They've seen all these school shootings. And they've grown up in this kind of world where you know they're they're they were thought to be timid, that they were gonna just kind of hide and they were kind of pent up in their homes, they weren't allowed to go out, they weren't allowed to take the train anywhere, you know, go into the city. Who knows what the hell will happen to them? But they've come out with tremendous activism and energy, right? They've been out there organizing with a good passion, right? Now, gun rights, you know, the gun issue is definitely something you know we want to talk about, but we want them to kind of mix into this movement by talking about economic issues because soon they're going to be going to college, right? They're going to be graduating. A lot of them are seniors, I think, it's They're going to be graduating and they're going to be hit with that student loan debt. So the gun issue is going to be important to them, and now they're going to have another issue they're going to be talking about: is how are we going to pay for our education? We we want to better ourselves. How are we going to do it if we're going to have to pay unbelievable amounts of interest? the next 30 years after graduation, you know, and maybe even more. So we want them to adopt some of these, these economic policies, not just to be a one issue kind of uh, situation, right? What we talk about, what our, what our program is, is really what we call the next New Deal. So the evolution kind of of FDR's New Deal policies. Um, we see this as the best way to unite everybody, right? The, the way, as I just kind of hopefully uh, Display the way to tie in all these different groups, no matter where you are. If you're from Trump land in Pennsylvania, or you're in some suburb in Atlanta that's very liberal, we all can find this common ground, right? Here it is. Next New Deal. So what is the next New Deal? First main pillar, 1% Wall Street sales tax. We demand a 1% tax to be paid by all U.S. sellers of stock, corporate bonds, derivatives, all of which must be traded and reported on open exchange. So no more of this rabid speculation where no one knows what the heck's going on. They can put the economy at this huge risk, right? And we don't even know what they're doing. The proceeds of this tax should be split between federal and state governments to fully fund social obligations, public payrolls, and pensions. Household level investments must be protected with a $1 million yearly exemption. So what that means is that every person that's in a family can have a $1 million exemption from this tax. So if you have five people in this family, you can you can trade up to $5 million and not get hit with this tax. Uh, it's not a wealth tax, but a sales tax directed at professional finance, financial speculation, like I mentioned. We want to really curb speculations. We do not want uh, Wall Street institutions trading money they don't have 
and then coming to us saying, all right, we're going to crash the economy if you don't cough up all this money. Um, and at that point, you know, what, what do we do? We've kind of already saw what happened once, and uh, you know, now we get hit with all this austerity as a feedback from that, right? as a, as a uh, offshoot of that. Like I said, we consider this hyper speculation. How about uh, money with 1% growth instead of 10%? Hold on to that question. We'll get to that after. I'll, I'll, we'll get to that definitely. Um, it's actually, a, we'll get to it. Second pillar, nationalize the Federal Reserve. We talked about a lot of problems with infrastructure, right? All the scientific spending. These things cost a lot of money, right? To get the infrastructure that we currently have, 3.7 trillion, just to get it to a state of good repair. That's not even adding new things. That's not adding Maglev or fixing JFK or LaGuardia or anything, making these things better. Just getting what we have back to a state of good repair. So we need a lot, a lot of cash. We're gonna need a huge infusion of some kind of credit to get that going. So we propose to seize the functions of the Federal Reserve system and use it as a national bank to finance the long-term needs of the American people. We don't wanna get rid of the Fed. You hear this a lot. The Fed has the ability to create credit out of thin air. So we want that to go to the American people, right? So they, if they, if you're involved in any kind of production, you know, if you want to build a bridge, you're going to build the train line, you can go to the Federal Reserve, they're going to offer you 0% credit, and you can build those. Well, obviously, mostly from state and local municipalities, not, you know, not just anybody. Um, overriding goal, creation of 30 million plus New jobs of production, high capital investment, high energy intensity, high value added, and high technology. All of these groups benefit from this, right? Every single one. We put everyone here. I can you worry about climate change. We have new forms of energy, better infrastructure, right? We're going away from some of these you know, gas guzzling things. We're going more towards nuclear and beyond. Um, high paying, right? All these, all these groups get, get the benefits of that. And this is how we can tie everybody together. Century bonds for infrastructure and science drivers, like I mentioned, a lot of money, a lot of credit needs to go out. So what you can do is just issue, uh, an institution will issue, issue a bond, so say the Port Authority, to say, hey, we want to build, we want to extend the PATH train right, to, to some of these. So we're going to sell, we're going to float these bonds, and we want the Federal Reserve to buy these bonds at 0%. So we will just pay the principal over 100 years. We don't want to get involved in interest and all these things, and then the project starts to get out of control. We just want to pay this stuff, get these infrastructure projects done, and then reap the benefits of, like I said, commerce flowing better. All the spin-offs, you put money into these sectors, and it doesn't just go into a black hole. You go and put money into Wall Street, we haven't gotten anything back from that, right? They continue to speculate. You put this money into building a bridge to X to Y or Y to Z, and there's, you know, people can commute faster. The goods can go faster. The people can take less time uh, traveling. It's just all these great spin-offs that, that occur for the economy. Mentioned this before, D plus infrastructure. Just to quickly go through the 3.9 trillion. Because we have a, a D plus infrastructure, you have 3.9 trillion losses to the US GDP by 2025, 7 trillion to lost business sales by uh, in lost business sales by 2025, and 2.5 million lost American jobs through the inefficiency caused by the infrastructure coming apart. Right? So if you, if you drive in somewhere, right? you, there's a pothole in the bridge, just some, some parts of the bridge are out. You know, the train's down, you live in New Jersey, it's been kind of a nightmare lately. You live in Long Island, right? It's been part of a nightmare lately. So well, the bridge collapses while you're driving. The bridge collapses while you're driving, and you know, it sounds like crazy, but yeah, this is happening here, right? So these are things that are in the news. <clears throat> so why can't we borrow from Wall Street? They're gonna hit us with massive interest payments, and it's gonna be forced upon the taxpayers, and then in order to pay these things off, we're gonna be put under austerity. And less less uh, opportunity for school programs, all these things to pay off the interest payments, pay off this debt. Historical credibility. We are not just throwing this stuff out there, and you know, there's, a, there's a lot went into this. And uh, the background is the American system that was based on Alexander Hamilton, um, Frederick List, Henry Clay, Henry Carey, Abraham Lincoln. And FDR's New Deal, the, the most recent kind of uh, incarnation of it. Um, so, I mean, you look at these names, it's pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. I think you'd be proud to be part of that. Um, going kind of off the program, you know, things that we, we talked about economic issues that ties together. Um, how about some institutions that are in the U.S. government that need some help right now, need some defending, worthy of defending? So we talk about the U.S. Postal Service. You hear a lot of nasty things about it, right? You have this battle between Bezos, Trump, and uh, 
threat to privatize always out there. Um, we want to kind of turn that away. Now, the people that kind of talk about privatizing the post office happen to be the same people that usually say they support the Constitution and uh, they believe in the dead hand of the Constitution. It's not a living document. And you take it literal as possible, right? Well, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 7, U.S. Constitution, Congress shall have power to establish post offices and post roads. So I don't know where the libertarians get this stuff. Um, but it's about as clear day as day in the Constitution as you can get. More so than probably anything out there. More so than most. Uh, it is a national treasure. US, the United States Postal Service is actually self-funded. No taxpayer dollars go to the United States Postal Service. Operates solely on postage and ancillary services. Delivers 157 million to 157 million addresses. Delivers and collects. This is important. It doesn't just deliver. If you go, kind of if you're in New York, you don't really see this so much, but if you're in more of a rural area, they actually will collect your from your mailbox four or five, sometimes six times a day, uh, six times a week. Delivers and collects mail customers no matter who and no matter where they are. So unlike UPS and FedEx, they don't just say, oh, sorry, we don't deliver that. Oh, you live in Montana and nowhere to go? Mm, sorry, um, we don't have a rate for that. We don't have a truck that goes there. Maybe like once a month we'll go there. Nope, US Postal Service delivers. So much so that these entities here, like UPS and FedEx, if you ever, find, if you ever track some of your stuff, you'll see that they'll actually drop at the post office because it's beneficial, it's cheaper for them to drop to the post office, have the post office deliver it, and they'll know it'll get there fast. So just keep it, check, take a look at that sometimes, you'll see that a lot. Um, but they'll do that also for some of the more obscure areas in the country. They'll just drop it to the post office and say, all right, you deliver it. We delivered it to here. Do you want that, you want these guys to be the model? You know, is that, is that, how does that can help small business in middle America, right? How, where does Trump, where does Trump come up with that? So where do you get that? Where does UPS, FedEx, how are they gonna help small business when they're just, they're just not going to deliver to a lot of these parts of the country. What's that? Yeah, yeah, we're going to get ready. Right, really close. Yeah, really close. Excellent point. Uh, we pro they process 500 million pieces of mail daily, delivers 47% of the world mail. 500,000 employees at union wages and benefits. Once again, good, good time with everybody here, right? So, why is the U.S. Post Office hated? Or why is it? View, not hated, but why is it viewed as something that's failing, right? 2006 Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. What this did was force the Postal Service to pre-fund 100% of future retiree health care costs 75 years into the future. That includes workers that have never, have not even been employed by the, by the company yet. They're unborn workers. Nobody, not one entity, no corporation, no government entity does this. It's completely absurd. It comes from nowhere, except for the threat to this, this, this obsession with privatizing. Well, pass to the pass to the pass to exactly, the pass exactly. Like I mentioned, no institution or corporation in the world follows this practice. It's, it's completely illogical. Um, if you took this burden off of the Postal Service, they would generate, on average, one billion in profits per year. It's a cash cow. It's an absolute cash cow Postal Service. This act also sets unreal, unrealistic price caps, so they're forced to keep the rates at a certain level that is not rational for the current economy, it doesn't, doesn't factor into inflation and things like this. And what is, the, what is the result of this? A lot of these middle America post offices got shut down, right? They lost workers. Uh, their facilities were closed down, right? This is all people Trump supposedly has a lifeline to, right? I don't think he does. Public review of the US Postal Service, how is it viewed by the population? This is a Gallup poll from 2017. Uh, United States Postal Service, 72% favorable in uh, 2014, and then in 2017, it's actually increased a little bit, to, uh, 74%, so uh, way above any government entity that you see here. Second institution I really like to talk about is the Veterans Administration. Also another institution that a lot of people, especially Trump, talk really bad about, or, or the line, but... Uh, under constant attack of privatization. Now let's get into why America needs the VA. Why is the VA worth keeping? You know, there are some issues there, and we want to we want to make sure we address those. But let's talk about some of the great stuff that's going on there. Three pillars of the of the VA: research leading to advances in medical care, medical care, training that's essential to build and maintain proficiency of care, and delivery of clinical care to help those in need. 
I don't know if you find the, the pharmaceutical with the United States like that. I, I'm not so sure. Um, VA trains 120,000 healthcare professionals a year, more than any system in the nation. So if you're worried about, hey, we don't have enough doctors, well, get rid of the VA or privatize the VA may not be such a good idea. Estimated 70% of all doctors have trained with the VA in some capacity. And how about some medical innovation? So it's pretty remarkable stuff that's going on. Uh, Pioneer to develop modern electronic medical records. First to administer medicine via barcode. Developed the implantable cardiac uh, pacemaker. Conducted the first successful liver transplant. Created a nicotine patch to help uh, smokers quit. Crafted artificial limbs that move naturally when stimulated by electrical brain impulses. They, you know, they're, they're so um, geared towards the veteran, right? This is there's no other better institution that can cater to the needs of the veteran, right? They have all this experience working with them. VA is uniquely positioned to contribute to the care of veterans with uh, traumatic brain injuries, prosthetics, PTSD, and the other mental health conditions in the treatment of chronic diseases such as diabetes and hepatitis. So you'll see, you know, start to see towards the back of that statement some of the spin-offs that come, not just, just veterans issues, but it's, it's issues that we all treat across diabetes and hepatitis. So what I hope we convey here is that there is this idea that there's this blue wave coming, right? Um, and yes, we need this, and yes, we do need to fight for this, but it's not a guarantee, and it's not a guarantee how long it'll be here. So we want to try to make this as lasting as possible. And the way to do this is we have to unify under these mass traction economic demands. And I hope you take some of these points and really apply them to when you go out. You know, if you go to a Congress, if you're lucky enough to get in, get in earshot of these people, to tell them, say, hey, look, don't just tell them, hey, I want, I want the trains to run better. I want the planes to run better. You're going to tell them how you want them to do it. Because they're going to tell you, hey, I want the trains to run better too. Next. But you got to tell them, this is how I want you to do it. And if you don't do it, we're going to vote for somebody else that's going to do it. So I want to thank you for your time. And I appreciate that. Do you want to take one or two? Yeah, or a couple or? questions, yeah. Um, I think, you know, a few things I will be as brief as possible. I've noticed uh, over the years, especially Forum like this, that people are they're too they're, they're too emotionally involved with their convictions, right? And you know, like the change that's the topic we're talking about, like you just kind of want to remain in flux. You have core ideals that you want to keep, but like the, the changing political and economic demographic. We have to be able to change with it. Right. And I think it's, it's very difficult for people to let go of ideas or positions that they've become emotionally attached to. It's almost like a, a religion, like where you, right. you believe and if anybody challenges it, whether it's a factual challenge or not, you, you respond a certain way like with hostility, hysteria. Right, <laughs> right. right. Because you, you, you believe this so much. In spite of the facts. And that's that's kind of what I want to get to with this slide here is that you know would would Connor Lamb win if he stuck to you know, just super left leaning policies in a Trump district? Like, Isn't it more important to win this seat, right? You're gonna keep you're gonna keep the core values are the same. That's the point. Now some of these other issues we can finesse along the way, right? As after the seizure of after you get control, right? If you get power. If you get back power, you know, we, we want to run on this stuff and then we can start getting into the other, you know, finesse the other issues. Uh, and the reason why I, I mentioned that is because, like, when I, I live here in New York, sometimes I get the opportunity to go to City Hall okay. or Albany. And a lot of people mean well and their heart is in the right place, but they're so focused on their issue to the exclusion of everything else. Right. right? And it's, they, they can't make the, the they can't make the, the leap, or they can't see the gap between immigration, LGBTQ plus, homelessness, uh, rights of the disabled. Like everybody's just doing their own thing. Right. That's, and yeah, this, this when you try to convey off. something like that, it's just it's just so foreign, and you know it's it's even more difficult to find a lot of the, the more open and 
progressive uh, politicians we have here. And like it, it's, the red line for them is Wall Street, right? Like, like they'll close down like this island. They'll, they'll go after this, they'll go after NYCHA housing. But when you start talking about going after Wall Street, that's the line they're not even going to cross. Think about crossing. Even if they don't get any major funding from them, psychologically, they're just so terrified. Right? And it's like, it's a taboo issue. It's very, very difficult. But we have to start somewhere. Right, and, th and this is what really ties us together, right? The economics. The struggle that we face economically is what really brings us all together. And then we can start, even some of this will actually pick up a lot of those issues, you know? A lot of those things you talked about, you know, imprisonment issues, environment, a lot of the, the economic stuff picks all that up eventually, you know, it, it brings all that up. Go big or go yeah, home. Yeah, you know, rise the tide, raise all ships. Um, really quick, I just wanted to get to that question about the um, the Wall Street sales tax. Yeah, how much are you getting about the demand? Almost impossible to say because they don't, we don't know how much of that is actually out there, how much of these derivatives are being traded. You know, the numbers are estimated as much as 1.25 quadrillion. Yeah. Now, the idea is we want to just we want to bring that down. We don't want to keep having that going. So that number is going to come down with this tax, right? The idea is that they won't be doing that as much anymore. We want to get those to a more normal level. If not, a, some of them will have to be banned, really, because they're just they're so toxic. They're so toxic. So difficult to say. I mean, New York has the tax on the books, and they refund it 100%. So if you look at New York state law. That's the degenerate government carry. Yeah. So these, no this, this is this is returned back to them. <laughs> as a as a refund. What tax do you want to watch? It's a New York State. Uh, oh gosh, so security. What? It's a security it's a transfer tax. Uh, it's a Wall Street sales tax, existing in New York State. And Governor Hugh Carey said, "Oh, uh, I'm afraid you're going to go to New Jersey with the stock market. So uh, what we're going to do is we'll we'll collect it in theory, but then we'll refund it. We'll give it back to you. And it was so you don't leave. Then we're not going to leave." What can we do? The New Jersey Stock Exchange? It's it was significantly higher than 1% as well, so it wasn't, that's even very, very modest. Quadrillion you mentioned, is that worldwide? Yeah, that's, that's true. Mm -hmm. yeah, but they're, they're all, you know, they, everybody see they're all private. Right, that's what we always find the same thing. Well, it, a lot of this is in Chicago also. Right? Chicago. The, the version there is called the LaSalle Street Tax. Because that's where some of these uh, the Chicago counter. Board Options Exchange, right. Chicago Mercantile like Exchange. Yeah. And that's some of the derivatives that are going to be. Oh, yeah. London, London absolutely. Yeah, massive. massive. I'm sorry, yeah. So if, if I look at this program and other points that you mentioned, you're, you're basically promising uh, the American people a, a, a mild or not so mild form of modern social democracy. So if I look at the numbers from a little bit of a distance, I look and I get my numbers from Piketty's book. Um, the countries that provide these have a public sector of 55%. So 60% is Sweden, 55% is France or Germany. They provide all this. They provide an up to date uh, infrastructure, they provide uh, free university, they provide full socialized medicine that really treats you. Uh, and um, I look then at um, the proposals that you make to fund all this. So I think the Federal Reserve is an interesting idea, mm -hmm. and I think that the uh, stamps of the U.S. Postal Office are also a really nice idea. But no way will you get the, the percentage, the public percentage of the GDP from the current 28 to 30 percent to the double by this kind of taxes. You will have to tell the American people the truth. They will have to pay a far bigger part of their income in taxes and get far better working public services in return. And if you tell them, we are going to do it and it's not going to cost you anything, that's what Trump does. No, well, I think you're, you're, you're missing a little bit of the, the economic impact of these things. Like they're amplifying the output of the economy. So you're not going to be stuck at this like one-to-one -one Level. It's not true what you're saying. I think you believe that, and I honestly think you believe that. Yeah. But I think you are wrong. If you want to have a functioning public infrastructure, you have to raise the tax level substantially. What do you, I mean, if you look at something like the. 
But not only on higher brackets, in general, in general, to give you an idea. Uh, let, let but especially uh, with reference to the German uh, speaking uh, experience, huh? the mobilization, the uh, confiscation, the dragooning um, nationalization of the Federal Reserve, in other words, we're saying no more central bank. Central bank is finished. We're going to national bank in the sense of Alexander Hamilton's first and second banks of the United States. And the idea is cheap credit for production. So what you can do, if you seize control of the Federal Reserve, say, no more will you serve the banking community only. You gotta serve the entire economy, not just bankers, right? Because you talk to these Fed guys today, they'll say, everything we do is financial. No, production, standard of living, full employment. So. You lower the cost of capital to practically zero. In other words, whatever interest rates have been charged, you can say that the Federal Reserve, for example, the example given, is in order to fulfill the demands of these uh, uh, Society of Civil Engineers, they say, you know, something like five trillion almost if you add up everything. So what you're saying is five trillion dollars for a hundred years if needed depending on the project, century bonds, right? And in order to do that, you're gonna have a 0% coupon, 0% interest. So you're rebuilding, you've, you've immediately removed all of the compound interest, all the, um, the burden. You have reduced the cost of capital to zero. And as long as you make sure that those loans go into production, be it infrastructure or scientific research or a space program, and the things that are production, you could do it. Now, the, the example of this, in the German-speaking world, there are two, and they're both from about 1931 or 1932. You have this Wilhelm Lautenbach, is the head of the Friedrich, or the representative of the Friedrich List Society. We mentioned Friedrich List, right? This is the guy who came from Germany. He did the customs union, the so-called Zollverein, including Austria. All the railroads in Austria, Czechoslovakia, built by him. Friedrich List. So he came to Reading, Pennsylvania, and was a big uh, influential guy in the US. So the, the society named after him said, in order to stabilize Germany after the British went off the gold standard, he said, we need two billion, three billion marks from the central bank, the Reichsbank. And what we're going to do with that is actually build the Autobahn. We're going to drain the pool of despairing workers. No Hitler. We're going to cut Hitler off at the knees because he won't have his unemployed despairing workers, is what we see here. And similarly, at the same time, a guy then who became an American, W.S. Wojtynski, was a Russian Menshevik who had come to Germany and he worked for the, the uh, uh, German unions, right? The De Ag Deutsche Allgemeine Gewerkschaft, that's him. So he comes up with this thing called the Tarno Bada Wojtynski Plan. And it's the same thing. Uh, uh, three trillion, three, three billion in those days. Three billion is about the same as a trillion. And use that to build infrastructure, above all, the Autobahn. Now, that's one of the historical roads not taken, but it could have been taken, and we would propose today to take it. In other words, you have all those, those people. We, we believe that these people in the Midwest who voted for Trump, yeah, they're racist, yeah, yeah, but economic despair is the big thing. So suppose you created 30 million new productive jobs. That's our estimate. To get to full employment, the United States has not seen full employment since 1945. <laughs> you don't even know what it looks like. I've been in countries, listen, it, I've seen full employment, right? In Italy in 1964, the economic miracle, miracolo economico, same thing in Germany, their chops wunder. I've been in Taiwan in the 80s, economic miracle. It's a whole different world because they're, they're saying we need workers, right? You know why you need uh, the dreamers, you need immigrants? 
because that's your workforce. As soon as you had an economic recovery, you're going to have a labor shortage. But please Soon. allow me to answer this, and I'll keep it really brief. I agree with, with all the intentions, and I even think that the method is not wrong. But I'm looking, when I say 30 or 55% GDP, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about hours worked in the end. And I think this is where our post our models means. But in the end, this is where the waters then converge. A far bigger part of uh, the added value is going to become, is going to go from private to communal. And there's nothing wrong with this. Sure. But my question is really, if you would tell this to the American people today, if you would tell people, yeah, you're going to keep less of well, but that's that never profit, occurs. But you're that gonna get, not. You're going to get a good hospital, and you're going to get a free university, and you're going to get a good train service, and there's not going to be any war. But it's anymore. not. There's no the, 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 tax, the when they they taxation is not on individuals. You know, that's just not in our program. Yeah, there should probably be the you know some of these tax cuts have to be rolled back now. That's complicated. But the general thrust is tax banks, tax hedge funds, Wall Street, these institutions, not the individual. Families, right? Because for many reasons, you want to uh, go back on that. The U.S. predicament. This is where Galbraith. Remember the affluent society of Galbraith. He says the U.S. is characterized by hoarding money in the hands of private persons and not enough for the public institutions, right? So we're proposing, in that effect, would be to redress that, so you'd have plenty of. Uh, you know, the universities and the hospitals and the public services, urban mass transit, some trains, you know, all these, these good uh, good things. So I don't I don't see that. And I think this guy Pickety, uh, I mean, I, it's really? been a while since anybody threw Pickety at me. I have a critique of Pickety, but I'm just, I'm not uh, recalling it right now. As, as Jeff Sullivan would point. say, I don't recall, uh, but I have a, I have a full-blown uh, critique of uh, Pickety. Um, yeah, it's just that it's wrong. In other words, economics is about development, right? It's about massive increases of production. That's the, the, the other thing. That's the, the U.S. experience shows that you can do all of this. In other words, the Franklin D. Roosevelt war, uh, you know, lend lease uh, and things like that, they showed that you can do everything. You can do everything, and you can more or less do it at the same time, as long as you're working with, with what he had. Lend-Lease had its own credit mechanism. I didn't have this credit mechanism where you could, if you had a government contract, you could take your contract with a vendor number on it. You could go to the local bank and say, I need working capital for war production. And they would send that to the Federal Reserve, and there was the obligation to discount. right? Disconto Pflicht. Got it? You were, the Federal Reserve was forced to discount that for you know, 99 and a half uh, percent. So this is this is eminently practical. All been done before. No pie in the sky. Yeah, right. There's look nothing at, we've talked look about. Look at the New Deal, right? And the, the kind of maturation of that, right? The late 50s, early 60s, right? Did, this stuff never happened. Right? Was, the family was at its high point. People had more, you know, expendable income. And the idea also that you can create something that wasn't there before, right? That, so by investing in science drivers, right? By investing in all these things, I can create something that I can find the cure for cancer, right? All it needs is capital. The only thing keeping me is capital, right? And I can't be tied down to the fact that, oh, well, we got 300 ounces of gold and uh, we got cancer and it's going to cost 1,000 ounces of gold to cure cancer. And this is hypothetical. But the idea is, is to play. Sure, yes. Sorry, we can't do it. Sounds like so much. Well, yeah, that's all. Sorry, but but I'm talking about I'm talking about the you don't want to be capped by this idea like we only have X amount of money or X amount of gold to invest in uh, research. We want to make it so you have this unlimited source essentially, right, to solve all these little problems. We have a deep state committed to profit at any cost. We have a military. Right, we're trying to get rid of them. We got to get all together. Get rid of these. We did the biggest attack on the deep state. We took care of them in the previous. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, I mean, you have to take it on a case by case basis. I mean, there's, 
No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not touching any of that. Here, but um, you know, there's you take that on a case by case basis. Right? There's some instances where not on every single one. You can't just blanket say like, oh, this is every time we have some kind of incident where kids get shot at school or something like this is this is some kind of uh, deep state issue. Um, but they may they may be. You know, I, I, I don't know um, every case, but the reason I ask you is gun control is part of the act. Raised on the cameras that I've been seeing, the violence and the DNA wedges. So I've been seeing a big back and forth arguments recently. Yeah, the wedges should be the wedges should be easier. They always come for you know, the government. They're divisive, right? Is that, is that what you're getting at? Are they are, yeah. they're more divisive yeah. than anything? Or? No? Keeps us from it's, coming it's, together? Well, the interest that the interest that promotes gun control is the same interest that promotes like so I would think less and less of guns. But look, uh, I'm hearing the the uh, voices of the paranoid libertarians of the airwaves here. Right? That terrorist incidents are organized by gun control forces to promote gun control. I think this is absolutely crazy. This is this is a lunatic thesis. Huh? Yeah, they happen, and if you look at each one of them, you can find something to object to in each one. It's true, I've done this myself, a lot. But um, it's clear that there is a severe problem of guns everywhere, and that the National Rifle Association is essentially a lobby for an industry which is destructive to society. In other words, it's a... This is a big moneyed interest, and they want to sell guns. Now, there's also the theoretical point. The ideal situation is where the national state has a monopoly or almost monopoly on the use of armed force within its borders. And the only way we ever got away from that was that the national state, because of economic decline, could not guarantee safety, so people felt that they need guns. Now, that has happened, right? That, that train has pretty much left the station. But the current situation, the idea that you'd want to have everybody walking around with guns. I grew up in New York City under the Sullivan Law. Ever hear of that? The Sullivan Law was no concealed weapons in the city. Couldn't do it. And I thought that worked uh, rather well. Now, of course, rural places need a more um, permissive regime. But the idea that terrorism is somehow organized by the evil forces of gun limitation, I, I just think the people the people who have been selling that line for several years, I think, are now largely discredited. And I urge you to you know, stop listening. Yeah, and my only point of bringing that up was just to show that those kind of issues are the ones you want to maybe finesse down the road, not lead so much in certain yes, areas. Right. So not so much to talk about that topic so much, but you know, the idea that, you know, hey, if that's it, that's something you have to kind of finesse that. You can't just go out there. But an area that's totally against that, and say, "Hey, I'm gonna, I want everyone to have guns." You know, and think you're gonna win, right. just because that's your your core, you know, your absolute. Same state where there's one lie, there's many. So you find the lie that's promoting gun. Who said that? <laughs> Is that Confucius? You're, you're not. You're not. I'm gonna be suspicious about the other thing. <laughs> The father of lies. Yeah, but I mean, what's what's more important to you, having the gun or or you know, being able to eat? I mean, I mean, that's that's kind of that's how I look at it. Could can I have? Uh, yeah. Can I proceed or did? Uh, is it, if you don't let, if you don't let me speak, then you then you won't hear me. So if you were interested in hearing me, then. just just one question in the back. Yeah, you had a question. They had right. for a while. Um, about your um, recent deal. Yeah. I like to suggest that. Even though the title language is out, but then the the three public colleges, no interest on American government loans and bonds. Where we go, the government entity they could have because of interest to American government on loans and bonds, grants, that kind of thing. That's ridiculous. That's in the program. Um, Absolutely. Being taxed on your own money, right? Because private bankers are have taken over the federal reserve. Hundred percent agree. And. You need to get rid of Dodd Frank and bring back Glass-Steagall. They take care of Rockefeller. It's it's definitely would help. Absolutely, sure, absolutely. But like, Dodd Frank, there are still some other things in Dodd Frank that would be worth keeping. But it's you not it's not as strong as Glass-Steagall. Yeah, you'd want to have Glass-Steagall, no problem. But the idea that Glass-Steagall solves everything this is a, a mystification. 
There are, you can believe, there are groups in the city that claim that. The wild dogs of the wilderness. Denied? Absolutely. All right. I guess I can stand up. If I can stay on my feet. Let's try. All right, so mine is very much along the same lines. Um, the three propositions in Texas, Texas Democratic primary March 5th, passed by 93 to 95%. So this is a sample of an important block of opinion that ought to tell us something about the organizing climate, right? What do people here actually want? So, um, we are in a mass strike period, right? Rosa Luxemburg wrote about this stuff. Well, welcome, you're living in it. Now, with the mass strike, the existence of the mass strike by itself, I'm afraid, does not solve everything. The mass strike has got to be guided. The whole point of revolutionary leadership, as Rosa Luxemburg wrote about it and others, is that a force of people who actually know what to do has to intervene. And it means that you can't expect the masses to come up with the program by themselves, right? We've been working on this program for decades, and it's a, it's a valid program. Our program is not a laundry list of demands. It's a program meant, meant to cater to different groups. It's a program that will actually produce a long-term, powerful economic recovery. It will work. It's worked before. So here we have our groups in motion. Trump, in some ways, has been the icebreaker of the revolution. He has pushed these masses into motion. So it's a mass strike, and everyone is marching. It's a great reality. Right? If you just live day to day, maybe you don't see it. But from the election day, there were already high school students demonstrating in Maryland, where I live. There was, you know, sometimes the roads would be shut down because they were protest marches against Trump. Now the Russians claim they organized some of them. Maybe they didn't. But the point was that there was a it was a great potential to protest. Now look, here are the different groups, right? Women. The Women's March of January 21st, 2017, was the biggest demonstration in the history of the United States. It was many, many millions of people, far more than, than what was reported. So out of this, we get the Me Too, Time's Up movement, and so forth. The black community has been in motion. There are attempts to uh, secure voting rights now that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 has been gutted by the reactionary Supreme Court. Voting rights and then Black Lives Matter, the issues of police reform and prison reform, right? the end of mass incarceration, the end of the prison industrial complex, and the need to reduce the prison populations. Now, immigrants, of course, Latinos, the dreamers, but it's, a, it's, it's essentially representing the entire world. Students, right? this is now Generation Z. They were expected to be a new silent generation, and they are not. This, by the way, this means that if you know the Strauss and Howe theories of the uh, cycles of generations, Strauss and Howe, they're not. It's not working. So their, their theory is, is up in the air. We have an unprecedented upsurge in the labor movement, and in particular, these teachers, teachers in reactionary states, West Virginia, Kentucky, Oklahoma, Colorado, Arizona, North Carolina. It's a, rebe a rebellion against ALEC, against the Koch brothers and their theories of um, austerity. And some of these teachers have one demand. LGBTQ, one of the things you saw in, uh, say, Virginia, was a very large number of representatives of this group, right? people who were transgender, among other things. And then, sort of the people we have here, right? progressive or anti-war activists. When it came to mobilizing to defeat Obamacare, the, the, the repeal of Obamacare, of course, 
this was the moment for these for these people, right? They did the demonstrations. They went into the town halls of the various congressmen. And uh, we hope that they remain mobilized, because right now we have an unprecedented danger of war involving Trump. Now, what's a winning strategy? We submit, unlike the alt-left, the alt-left is among us, right? Their tentacles are here. The alt-left is not a part of the left. It's a part of the alt. <laughs> and you don't want to be a part of the alt. <laughs> so for Trump, in Washington, there were two camps. There are the moderates who are for impeachment, and then there are the militants and the radicals who want indictment. And we've already discussed the, the Spiro Agnew model suggests that indictment is eminently feasible. The goal is in general to break the exorbitant, overweening power of Wall Street finance on all phases of national life and of the world too. It's necessary to go beyond mere protest to actually take power in some way, to get a hold of a piece of power and use it. You want to have an economic recovery, you want to have full employment, a rising standard of living, longevity, rising standard of life expectancy. In many states, it's falling. And generally, we've discussed my previous year here that the Republican Party is historically doomed to extinction, and uh, it should disappear. They've lashed themselves now to the carcass of Trump, and when he goes down, we expect they will also dwindle to a regional party. The New Deal wing of the Democrats needs to be strengthened so that it can prevail over the Wall Street wing, which is often dominant right now. Here's one of our favorite people. Representative Al Green of Texas sponsored the first impeachment resolutions and have gotten one third of the Democratic caucus to vote for impeachment, right? So that's uh, leadership. Now, our starting point, as was already mentioned, but I'm gonna to try to harp on this because this is a big deal that has been neglected. The New York Times didn't have it. Couldn't find it. Washington Post, also not. It wasn't on the NBC Evening News. The Texas Democratic Party, March 6th. These are the questions that were approved by 93 to 95% of the votes, right? Medicare for all, it's a right. Notice they were clever enough not to say single payer. The single payer, everybody says, what the hell is single payer? What is that? Medicare for all. Everybody knows exactly what that means. Everybody likes it. Second point, the Federal Reserve should provide essentially 0% interest to refinance the student loan debt burden, which is now $1.5 trillion. Trillion! $1.5 trillion. Way more than even credit card debt. And you can refinance this over long maturities. So, if you say free college, we're for free college, but that doesn't help the people who are already saddled with the 1.5 trillion. That's already happened, they're saddled. And then, very cheap, 0% long-term credit to rebuild US infrastructure and create millions of jobs, right? We would say 5 trillion, this is not in the resolution, but this is me embroidering. $5 trillion and 30 million productive jobs. There's a separate program financed by that Wall Street sales tax, which is then a 10 million job proposal. The Conyers, even though he's now uh, he's out of uh, favor, but still he did this. Uh, the Conyers Act is to tax Wall Street to create 10 million new jobs. You would add the name of Marion Barry, the late mayor of Washington, D.C., who said, every kid in the city who wants a summer job is going to get it. And he went to the Washington Post and said, now hire the people. So these demands and, and the, the, um, the, the notion of a common denominator is the thing we'd like to stress. The common denominator. What does it mean? The political landscape is full of fragmented groups. We've called attention to them. Can they be united? Yeah, they have to be united. How can they succeed if they don't unite? 
Divide and conquer is the oldest trick in the oligarchical book. But in this case, uh, it's the common denominator. So the Texas Democrats told us that they regarded these demands as a common denominator to unite the existing uh, groups, the ones who are demanding change and reform, and to strengthen them. They do better with this. Notice, the existing groups are not, not asked to stop doing what they're doing. In many cases, they should continue doing what they're doing, but in an even more energetic way. The idea is to extend your demands, include Medicare for all, student debt relief, jobs and infrastructure for everybody. In other words, it's the one area of mutuality. It's where everybody is saying, you know, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Right? The obvious, the essence of politics. And there were many people in Texas that told our people that these mass traction economic demands were a better way for them to attain their existing goals. In other words, they had their own program already, but the idea that you could be stronger and have more resources to work with thanks to this kind of a program, they found this appealing. I think that's very important. Now, some history of this stuff. The New Deal of Franklin D. Roosevelt accomplished maybe more than anybody ever did. Uh, LBJ is a kind of competitor, but I think it's going to be FDR. So what do we have? The big city machines. Yeah, corrupt. I guess they're corrupt. The labor movement, including the CIO industrial unions, right? CIO. They were the radicals. The South. And with all the problems this brings, right? The South. Uh, you can imagine. But nevertheless, they were part of it. Intellectuals. A lot of people were writing for the WPA. Soldiers, right? There were 10 million people in the armed forces. They could vote. Farmers, sometimes at the beginning. Now notice the, the civil rights record, the fairness to black Americans was wanting. It was not enough. But still, the WPA, PWA pro projects hired, especially in the northern states, lots of black workers. And they benefited. And this is uh, for these reasons that you could understand the decision of the black community is to leave the Republican Party of Lincoln and to join the Democratic Party, right? what has been ever since. Now we have other, other panels telling us that this was original sin, that this was bad. Um, yeah, it had its upside and downside. But again, compared to what? What are you going to do? Have a third party? It, it, anyway, and the, remember, the Republican wage issues target this coalition. Newt Gingrich is on record somewhere where he says, the main task we've always had is to smash up the New Deal coalition. The Russian trolls are on exactly the same line. There are now these thousands of Facebook ads that have been published, which is always sowing discord racial provocations, and so forth. And they're exactly the same as the Republicans. So the Republicans and the Russians are united. They have a united front. You better have a united front, too. So in the New Deal, it is interesting that the struggles in society centered on material interests of the entire class, or close to it. And this was stuff like stopping foreclosures, having parity prices for farmers, wages and hours, an eight hour day, five day or six day week, no child labor, a minimum wage, unemployment insurance, social security, national defense, which meant anti-fascism. The US defense mobilization was not automatic, but it had to be fought for by unions. You can read the work of uh, George Seldes, a very interesting writer of the time, that there were lots of big business interests who preferred Hitler to Roosevelt. Simple. The labor movement in those days was seen as the main movement, and it was often seen as groups, some groups wanted to attach their demands to the labor movement because they thought the labor movement was a vehicle for progressive change. That would be the way to go. Now, by contrast, 
More recently, we're in the age of the ethno-cultural uh, demands. Recent political struggles focus more on status prerogative of specific groups for their cultural values. In other words, the identity politics uh, method. And uh, yeah, I think it's time to take a hard, sober look at the results of that. Um, and again, the main outcome is you need the common denominator. So make sure that you have a New Deal economic policy to go with your left-wing social and cultural policy, and you're going to go much further. Now, a really good example is Martin Luther King, the real one, not the fake one. As a mature political leader in 1967-68, he got to this point. You had to have the civil rights movement in black America, but also white. You had to have the anti-war movement, some famous speeches in 1967, where a lot of uh, white liberals, Cold War warmongers were very upset. Civil rights, anti-war, and then labor. What was he doing when he fell? The sanitation men strike in Memphis. So civil rights, anti-war, and labor. And that is effectively a winning coalition. It's an updated New Deal uh, coalition. And it would have added other groups. And in many ways, right, we're marking now the 50th anniversary of the murder of Robert Kennedy. That is June 6th, right? So a couple of days from now, next week. This is, to some degree, what Robert Kennedy was doing, right? Stories about his intervention into Indianapolis, Indiana, and how he was able to, um, I don't want to say bring people together, but that's the idea. This is a cliche that has been so abused, but he actually did it. Now, there were people who countered King. The Ford Foundation said, no, community control of schools is the main thing. So we have the Ocean Hill-Brownsville School District fighting against Albert Shanker and the United Federation of Teachers. And this thing, it degenerated into what? Racism on the one side and anti-Semitism on the other. Jewish teachers are fighting against the black community. That was planned. That's divide and conquer in action, orchestrated by McGeorge Bundy of the ruling class. We've also got Nixon and his Secretary of Labor, George Schultz, and he said, let's get the black unemployed to fight the uh, white, lily white construction unions. Now, you could have done this in a different way. You could have said, we demand the building of a new interstate highway system or something like that, and half the jobs go to the black community, or two thirds, whatever you want. Make a demand. But this was not the path uh, taken. And the result is the, the hard hats, right? Coming out to support Nixon and beating up the anti war protester down here in uh, Wall Street. Now, the Trump phenomenon has something to do with that. Now, masses in motion. Once again, women, what does it mean? It means the majority of society. How can the majority of society be an oppressed class? It's, it's grotesque, right? This has to end. And it's also the case, the status of women is the greatest barometer of human civilization. Tell me the status of women, and I will tell you how civilized a, civil, uh, a form of culture actually is. Blacks, all right, this is the central problem of American history. It's gone through the Civil War and Jim Crow and into our own time. And this has also got to be solved, but it, there are problems here of racism, but there are also other problems that we have to face. We have police reform, prison reform, but you're also going to need jobs, housing, health care, urban mass transit, similar in many ways to the women who have many of the same issues. They also have a problem of choice, securing choice, and not being molested. Now, in the case of the women, I would say the labor market is of great interest because if a woman is being molested in a job by an oppressive boss, what's her first line of defense? Is to say, I quit. 
I don't need you. I can get the same job across the street for the same money or maybe even more, because now I'm experienced. The goal here is to see the, uh, I guess the, they call it the intersectionality of these demands. But I don't see, to me, the ontological reality is it's all the same struggle, and it's not uh, you know, a, a passing or coincidental uh, cooperation. Immigrants, again, they need everything we've said so far, but they need citizenship and education. Why is this important? That's the future of your labor force. You realize that the population of Russia is shrinking? You realize the population of China is shrinking? These are going to be severe problems. Europe is shrinking. Japan is shrinking. Only the US has a growing population. And that's your ticket to survival. That's really the most important single consideration. I can't, I don't understand these, well, I understand them, but <laughs> to say that immigrants are bad. Who's going to be working to pay your social security if not an immigrant? Are we crazy? It's absolutely essential. Um, the United States could easily advance to, um, ooh, you know, five or six hundred million in the next uh, couple of decades, whereas China is going to be shrinking. In other words, if you feel uh, pessimistic that China is going to rule the world, not, not, not necessarily at all. Because they had the one child per family, right? They followed these crackpot uh, population bomb theories, and they have done themselves grievous damage. So we didn't, we didn't do it. Students, okay, Generation Z, they've turned out to be activists. And again, in September, some of them are going to go to campus. And before the end of this year, all of those kids who have been on television are going to find that they've got student loans. And they may have to pay them even before they start graduating. Now, labor, and together with labor, I would always put the unemployed. Because if labor doesn't con uh, consider including the unemployed, they're lost. So we have to fight these right to work laws and obviously create uh, jobs in the job market. LGBTQ, it's a matter of rolling back a whole series of oppressive, discriminatory laws, and then once again, for the progressive and the anti-war activists, they ought to be the salt of the earth. And by defeating the Republicans on Obamacare, that's a great achievement. And again, right now, I don't want war with North Korea. I don't want war with Iran. And uh, Trump is a public menace. Now, if you want to be a revolutionary organizer, what do you do with this? Do you encourage each one of these groups to be more radical? Huh? To radicalize their own demands for themselves? I don't think so. I think that's not going to be the best way. What you want to do is to break down or partially remove the artificial barriers that prevent these groups from cooperating on themselves. Because these groups are not ontologically separate. You know, I think they're ontologically the same. Now, um, there's a theory. Why did the white workers of the Rust Bowl vote for Trump? And was it just, was it pure racism? Was it pure resentment? And so forth. I'm sure there's a lot of that. No, no doubt about it. But the, the margin of this becoming a public menace is economic distress. Notice, the United States standard of living has declined by about two thirds since the oil crisis of 73. Minus two thirds. This is the root of Trumpism. And it's just like what we were talking about before. If you wanted to prevent the Nazis, you had to drain the pool of despairing workers, sort of the same idea. Two thirds of this population have seen college going out of reach, their homes lost to foreclosure, and small businesses hit hard. I picked those three, because that's the GI Bill of 1945. In other words, you have a right to a home, you have a right to a small business, and you have a right to go to college. And all of that is being rolled back. The American 
military defeated fascism on the battlefield and won for us these rights, and they're being taken away. And they're all part of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Eight Point uh, Economic Bill of Rights of 1944. So there's also a question of power. Power. Uh, there are some demands that can be the leading edge, right? That are going to be extremely popular, right? Medicare for all, paid for by Wall Street, paid for by the Fed. That's going to be very popular. Lead with that everywhere. There's nobody who's going to be against that. However, there are some things that are more complicated, like this gun control stuff. And this, I think, generally speaking, comes a bit later, at least in the uh, full sense. So once a majority is there, there are other issues that can be tackled. And once, once you've got a, a, a government that's going and you've won people's confidence, then you can go on and do more things. So a couple of things. These are great minds think alike. Uh, so I'm going to rush through these. Right? Suppose uh, being and doing. 2013 New York City mayor's race, we had Quinn of the city council. What's her campaign? Her gender identity. Well, was that enough? Looks like it wasn't. They said, well, the, the voters you in New York said, no, we uh, we ought to get somebody who's more concerned with needs, right? Things like preschool, stuff like this. Now, in Virginia, Danica Rome, this is really interesting. This is the first transgender woman to be elected to the Virginia House of Delegates or indeed any state legislature in the United States last November. Her opponent was a 13 year incumbent, a reactionary, a swine. He was baiting her the whole time about. Uh, who she was and all this stuff. He called himself the chief homophobe, chief homophobe, and was the sponsor of a bill to ban same-sex marriage. So she wanted to make the gender identity the big issue. And she said, no, that's not my issue. I want to talk about traffic and commuting. And she won. This tells us, I think, a very important thing. She said, look, we're, you know, Northern Virginia to D.C., this is a real uh, drama. Now, I went through some of this stuff, right? Ralph Northam, the guy had a centrist or even maybe a little bit right of center profile, but he understood two things. Attack Trump, which he did, and Medicaid expansion. And as was just mentioned, it's going through. 400,000 people in Virginia. This fundamentally changes the reactionary state of Virginia, we could say the Confederacy is dying finally in Virginia because the government in Richmond, the cradle of the Confederacy, the capital of the Confederacy, they're finally going for something uh, decent, 400,000. Uh, we mentioned Connor Lamb. So Trump said, oh, that guy sounds like a Republican. No, 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 no. He's for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid against Trump and Ryan. He's pro-union. He says the United Steelworkers are a vital part of the nation. Organized labor built Western Pennsylvania. And the Davis-Bacon Act. You know what that is? Davis-Bacon says if it's a federal construction contract, they have to pay the prevailing wage scale, which means the union pay scale. And our people in Texas tell us that this is seen as a way to go into right-to-work states, in other words, union-busting states, reactionary states, and say, on these federal projects, you got to pay the equivalent of union wages. And once they've tasted the, uh, the joy of a union wage, they're going to want that, and they're going to start organizing unions. So this, this is how you go to the Rust Belt. This guy out in Alabama, right, Doug Jones. Now, this is a right-wing Democrat, no, no doubt about it. But he had prosecuted these Ku Klux Klan people for the bombing of the uh, Baptist church there in 1963. His big thing was no repeal of Obamacare. That's how he defeated the, uh, the monster uh, Judge uh, Moore. And his first bill is what to do about the crisis of rural health care, that rural hospitals are shutting down. These are all, notice, practical, kitchen table 
bread and butter issues. This is where leftism, you want to be a leftist, you got to be for this stuff. Don't tell me about other uh, more uh, recondite issues. So be true to yourself and to your district, sure, and support New Deal economics. That's the big thing. So we're also told that the thing that gets a lot of traction these days, at least in these Texas circles, where we've obviously been talking to the people who did this, we were talking to them before too, the 0% financing of the student loan debt is an organizing issue. In other words, you can organize people that are young, smart, they haven't been beaten down, they have not fallen on the thorns of life so that they've you know, given up. No, they're still full of fight. And they say, look, we have to have lives here. We need to have marriage, home, children. We gotta buy things, cars, appliances, and all this stuff. This is uh, also of interest to local businessmen. Right? They wanna sell them these things. So if you freeze that debt, you free up consumer spending. And that's, again, how to do the 30 million new jobs. Now, infrastructure. Trump promised infrastructure, right? Guess what? He lied. He lied. It's shocking. Um, what he put forward was a program to privatize the existing junk, as we heard, uh, put it under the control of hedge funds and uh, private equity, private equity, like Bain Capital. But slapping on tolls, slapping on tolls, uh, and the states and cities would pay forever. So we say, no, do what was done under the Eisenhower interstate highway system. The federal government's going to pay, but this time not out of the treasury. It's going to be the 100-year, 0% century bonds that the Fed is going to buy, and that's where you get the money. Now, we had... The, the question of Ellicott City, Maryland, seems to be an issue in Texas. Ellicott City is this place near Baltimore. They've had 2,000 year floods in the last two or three years. So the idea that you need the Tennessee Valley Authority everywhere is still a live issue. In this case, it would be the Patuxent River Authority <laughs> is a little creek, but then it goes crazy. So fortunately, I think one person died, a tragic uh, loss, to be sure. But then think about all the other things, right? Positive train control. You've got to have that. So you know, you can, you just, within, if, if they did a, a crash program, you could say in about two or three months, there'd be no more fatalities on U.S. passenger and commuter railroad. The TGV, right? The French bullet train, and then the Maglev. And again, Davis Bacon, to force that into these places. Let's think about something that doesn't get enough play, child poverty. In Arizona, they're always telling us what a great guy McCain is. Uh, I guess he's, as long as he's attacking Trump, I guess we're going to tolerate him. But in Arizona, child poverty is now 36%. Think about that. In the Southwest in general, it's one third. The United States, in terms of child poverty, is now 36th in the world, worse than Russia. Oh boy, that hurts. And that's going to be a problem in terms of propaganda wars, right? Remember, the Soviets would say they had the better standard of living and the social services. Well, in this case, there it is. In the US, urban child poverty, 18%, rural child poverty, 25%. This is a recipe for national suicide, because that's your future. That's where you got to pour in resources, right? pouring in. We always hear this from certain people. Anyway, we want to pour resources into that. Now, here's one that you didn't think of. You want to have a resistance, right? It should be anti-fascist, wouldn't you say? The United States is the most anti-fascist country. The United States never had a fascist government, never allied with a fascist. For example, Russia, Soviet Union allied with Hitler. We never did, and uh, did not appease. Roosevelt did not appease Japan, did not appease Germany. So this is the anti-fascist country par excellence. Be proud of it. Don't let some 
demagogue tell you anything other than this. This is the historical fact. So uh, one of the biggest, one of the top two, I guess, along with France, the uh, anti-fascist resistance in 43, 44, 45 against Nazi occupation is Italy. And maybe we can learn a little something from those Italians of that time. How did you organize a, an anti-fascist uh, resistance? So they had something called the National Liberation Committee. Comitato di Liberazione Nazionale. This started in September 1943. That is when Mussolini was deposed and uh, actually put in jail for a while. So they started. Now, the, the idea here is these are groups that were bitter rivals. Right? I'm sure they killed each other at different points, but they nevertheless realized, hey, if we want to end the Nazi occupation and have a country after this, we have got to do what? Unite the different groups. So here's who they united, right? Christian Democrats. De Gasperi became the prime minister, not much known here. The Christian Democrats, who are essentially the Vatican in politics, unite with who? With the communists, who are Stalin. Can you think of this? Is there, any, is there anything similar in the US that's this extreme as a, a clash of ideologies? The Italian Socialist Party, in many ways, was further left than the communists. Because the communists were listening to Stalin, the socialists were listening to the masses, so they were more radical. Then there was another quite radical thing called the Action Party. This was uh, sort of middle class intellectuals, but again, they weren't listening to Stalin. And then the Italian Liberal Party. Who is that? Big business, right? Fiat, Olivetti, um, Pirelli. Big business is sitting with the communists and the socialists. There was also then the Labour Democratic Party. Now, they realized soon that if they had attained this, this kind of unity before uh, fascism, right after World War I, 1920 to 21, there would not have been fascist regimes. In other words, it's been in Germany, it's the German one is often cited, that the social democrats could not ally with the communists against Hitler because Stalin ordered the communists to say that the main enemy was the social democrats. So you're attacking your natural ally. In the case of Italy in 1922, it's the similar thing, but in, in that case, it would have been these different groups. So, that's the uh, Italian way, the resistance, right? You want to have a resistance, doesn't it make sense to go and look at people who have actually conducted a successful resistance against a very, very formidable enemy under really rough conditions? I would say so. So um, my final note, we need organizers. We want you to work with the Tax Wall Street Party and the United Front Against Austerity. The task of organizers, again, is not to encourage people to become more radical in what they're already doing, but to add a dimension that they don't have, which is going to make it possible for them to succeed. Now, the main lesson of a strike, as soon as there's a strike, spread it. Get new groups coming in. Have a strike support committee. Uh, expand it to include a bubble of the unemployed, or it will be crushed. I should have made more of this, but all those groups that I showed you, the seven, the one thing they all have in common is that if they don't unite, they will be crushed. They will be defeated. If they can't find a way to come up with a common platform, we would suggest this one, others might, but the idea of having it, right? going in the direction of some kind of a coordination of the kind we just showed you, they're going to be defeated. So if the groups are divided, an intellectual, you want to call yourself a revolutionary intellectual, that's a great thing to be. That's the highest calling in our time. The goal then is to break down the barriers and bring the lessons of history to bear. What does history teach us about the way to act now in the situation we're in, because we've never we've never lived through it. It's going to be 
difficult. So that's my two cents for today. Thank you. And now we are at your service. Huh? Uh, pretty much, but it, you see, the, some of these things are, um, I guess you could say Pinochet was a military dictator, right? But he had done fascist overtones. So, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's kind of uh, semantics. That is semantics. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Chairman, please. Well, he had a he had a fascist movement also. Right? Exactly. Did Pinochet have that? I don't know. Maybe I guess in some ways he did. It's sort of I can move around them as things around the top of the But anyway, I, I have some ideas um, for organizing, uh, basically for people who like to promote retrospective. I don't watch a lot of television, but the news hour last night had a, a story about how only one third of all the candidates running for Congress are veterans. And you know, we should reach out to them based on the VA, the distribution from the VA, uh, not privatizing the VA, and endorsing uh, you know, anyone who is interested. Mm -hmm. So the idea of, of kind of vetting candidates and endorsing them, if we could start to sort of get and see what they do, we could see if we could do it higher than a bunch of like Wall Street companies, ways which we start but are maybe receptive to uh, to the voters of the country. So but it's it's a number that they put in one third of all candidates are vets. That's a trigger. No good to call better for free. Sure, for sure. That's what he's for 20 bucks. I think it gives you a membership in it. It cross the gaps. Or I don't qualify. Yeah. You don't have to do My personal Vietnam was the corner of Michigan and Balboa at this you Democratic convention when they gassed me and they were coming after me with clubs. You don't have to be a veteran. <laughs> they will accept. I'm a member. I'm not a veteran. Okay. Okay. You know, I've been thinking about this for a while. I'm glad it was spurred of the discussion in relation. As far as the tax Wall Street Party United Front against austerity and American system TV, the collective entity, uh, I was thinking in terms of having or creating or promoting uh, a lobby situation. Not like a lobby, lobby firm or anything, but anybody that's influencing anybody in politics. They have some sort of a lobby. They have representatives, they have people that are going there, whispering into their ear, passing before them. And uh, it's going to require people, it's going to require organization. And uh, I think it's something like in the long term to, to pick up because um, a lot of the problem with the ideas and with the, the program for action that we experience here and the experience from. And listening to it, it, it's it's broken in a sense. It's it's small, and it, it kind of dies into itself. Uh, it's small, but it, that's our next situation. It has potential, but without additional life and with, without additional input, it just kind of collapses on its own. It doesn't really get very far. But studying, you know, like the, the political apparatus. Mm -hmm. A, a lobbying committee or a lobbying uh, organ is very important, as well as a fundraiser. I don't know what, what what's done for purposes of if if uh, outside of American system TV, maybe they have like a store, they have merch, and they have other 
person has a lot of focus in terms of this but like something that more people can give input to uh, t-shirts and drinks for the summer anything that will generate uh, some sort of fundraising capital that, that, could, that would help fund uh, representatives like we had uh, Rodriguez and people before that were active in participating you know, like you, you hire people to do signatures, you 